Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's the 28th of August. It's less than 24 hours until the launch of SLS on Artemis 1. But in the meantime, I'm here with a batch of deep space updates. And we start with the launches as usual. So yeah, uh, 19th of August, it began with a launch by Long March 2D, carrying a batch of three Yaogan uh, reconnaissance satellites into low Earth orbit from Qichang. These are military satellites uh, for the you know, Chinese People Liberation Army or whatever don't really know very much about them so let's go on to the next one starlink batch 4-27 launching from florida that was 53 satellites into a standard leo orbit what was interesting from this for the long-term space watchers is the telemetry nerds the people that look at the numbers on the screen they have noticed that the second stage appeared to be generating or accelerating about seven percent faster than usual therefore generating more thrust um so it looks like they're getting more performance out of the Merlin vacuum engine. It was also a kind of neat image by a space station guy on Twitter who got uh, basically an image of the Starlink upper state or the upper stage and the deployment like you know minutes afterwards. So we got them all very close together. He does a lot of images of space stations and stuff like this, but he's previously caught Starlink in progress. On the 23rd of August, a Quaiso 1A rocket launched uh, a satellite called, well, we know that satellites are called Ch uh, Chuangqing. Yeah, I'm going to really mess that one up. Chuangqing 16A and B. And honestly, we don't know very much about this. The official news description was this was going to perform, they were going to perform scientific experiments and verifications of new technology. What I do know is that the Kwaizu 1A is one of the more successful like small sat launch vehicles from China. It's been launching since 2013. It is three stage solid rocket motors with a third liquid stage for orbital trim. It can put about 1500 kilograms into low earth orbit and it's operated by a company called X Pace, which if you say it very quickly, might give, uh, might give you some ideas about some other stuff. Uh, also notable that this was the first Quaizo launch from Qichang as well. Usually they use uh, Jiquan for this. I'm not sure if there's something going on there. Um, 23rd of August, we had another Chinese launch, a Long March 2D, again to low Earth orbit, carrying a Beijing 3B satellite. So this launched from Taiyun. Uh, and yeah, this is a remote sensing satellite. It's supposed to be a commercial uh, satellite operated by 21st century aerospace technologies. And we don't know what capabilities it has, but we do know that it is purportedly better than Beijing 3A, and that had a resolution of 0.5 meters in its color imager and two meters for its multispectral imager. Finally, on the 28th of August, just hours ago, we had a Falcon 9 carrying a batch, uh, Starlink batch 4-23. And this actually was switched from 39A to Slick 40 to uh, reduce conflict with Artemis, which or SLS, which is sitting there right now. It used Booster 1069. And if you remember back in December, that launched CRS-24. It was successfully recovered, but as it was brought into port, it was clear that it had a rough time at sea. And so I guess they've repaired it since then and it's flying again. Also, it was the heaviest payload ever launched by a Falcon 9, 16.7 tons. And that Previous uh, higher performing second stage was uh, appeared to be in use this case. It burned for a little longer to account for the extra mass. So it looks like they're getting better at, you know, really burning down those propellant margins on the, the second stage. So yeah, um, what else? There was a really awesome picture of Jupiter that came out of JWST. Everyone just look at this and you can see, like, because it's in infrared, you know, you're really able to see features in the atmosphere which aren't visible well in visible light we can this is the i think the first time i've seen an image from earth that shows jupiter's ring i may maybe i'm wrong about this but it was really obvious in this case you can see the satellites uh, fantastic you know jwst has obviously continued to go, do good work uh, it published the first evidence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of an exoplanet. Again, this is something we sort of expected we would see. We think carbon dioxide is pretty common in the universe, but actually seeing it is you know, what uh, JWST is capable of. And by the way, I'm, I'm just going to pause for a second. The last couple of Deep Space updates, I kept on meaning to congratulate 
BPS space on their successful demonstration of a launch and recovery of a model, you know, amateur rocketry. Mo amateur rocket model is model rocket. No, no, it's amateur rocketry. So you, you gotta imagine this thing is using little solid rocket motors, and somehow they built a system which allows it to return, throttle that little solid rocket motor and successfully land. That was a, like a month ago now, and I, I kept on forgetting to say this, because I think it's a really awesome achievement for amateur rockets. Okay, so yeah, we mentioned there was a couple of uh, SpaceX launches of Starlink. I guess big announcement in the last couple, I think it was Thursday, SpaceX and T-Mobile got together to have an announcement at Starbase saying that they are going to be providing mobile phone, like cellular service, via the next generation Starlink, and T-Mobile was going to make this part of their potential plans. Now, a lot of you don't realise that, you know, cell phones could in theory talk with satellites, the satellite just needs a big enough antenna and a powerful enough antenna, and no modifications are needed to smartphones. Now, Historically, we've had satellite phones, things like Iridium and Global Star both provide uh, cell phone servers, so they did provide cell phone service. Uh, Iridium obviously has replaced their entire satellite network and they use SpaceX. They were one of the first great, you know, uh, one of the first big customers for SpaceX ordering about 10 launches. But if you put big enough satellites up there with enough transmission power, there's no reason why you can't do that with regular cell phones. Now. This is obviously not full-on 5G awesome data rates. If you are doing this at the high, at the real, you know, the really weak margins that they have available on these satellites, you're probably going to get only two to four megabits for each cell, and each cell is of like 15 miles across or thereabouts. So this is fine if you're in the middle of nowhere and you're the one person trying to do something. Ideally, if you're in the middle of nowhere, you should be able to call an emergency service. You should be at least be a very able, you should be able to text. And I think the, the way they've talked about it is the first way it's going to operate is it's going to be you know store and forward ability to send text messages and maybe not get them right away. You know, so this is sort of potentially a big deal, but it is at least a year out, probably more, because the FCC is very much going to have something to say about. Uh, T-Mobile assigning its spectrum to SpaceX. Also, it's definitely not going to be worldwide. It's going to be US, maybe sections of the ocean, because cell phone services vary from one country to another, and you can't unilaterally have one country giving this access to everywhere around the world. Anyway, um, there was also another SpaceX... Well, there's a couple of things. Obviously, SpaceX... Uh, there's the, you heard a couple of weeks ago about how they lost $900 million in you know, the Rural Broadband Fund. There's uh, been some pushback on this. FCC commissioner saying this is not the right thing to do, uh, which is, of course, interesting because the FCC did this. Um, SpaceX were in court with uh, Viasat and Dish Network, who were challenging changes to the Starlink deployment plan, and SpaceX won in court. Viasat were basically saying... You can't just change the altitudes of these orbits without committing to a full environmental review. And the court found that, well, space isn't actually covered by environmental protection right now. Maybe it should. But regardless, uh, that allowed the change to proceed. Okay, uh, what else? What else? So NASA. NASA, obviously, Artemis, ready to go. We mentioned that at the start. I talked about Artemis earlier in the, the week. 70% uh, chance of the weather as I, being good as I speak may have changed by this point. But a couple of weeks ago, NASA also had a little press conference where they announced landing sites for Artemis 3. So I think they identified 13 regions near the lunar south pole. These are regions that are about 15 kilometers by 15 kilometers. They had to be scientifically interesting regions and they also had to provide terrain in like 100 meter blocks that were sufficiently flat and clear that you could land a lander. Now obviously the lander of choice right now is Starship and uh, other landers may have other requirements. Anyway the region names have things like Faustini Rim, Leibniz Beta Plateau or Peak near Shackleton. You know they're looking for permanently shadowed regions and craters where water might be trapped and that would be very useful for 
future uh, in situ resource utilization from the moon. Uh, they did actually talk about Starship as a lander and they mentioned that the test flight of of a starship as a human landing system to the moon would be a skeleton vehicle, you know, not decked out in all the gear that the atmosphere astronauts would need. And actually, apparently, they just needed to demonstrate a landing and not a takeoff, although I would really hope that they would demonstrate a takeoff. Uh, and this does mean then that we've got more than one lunar starship that will have to be built because they will need the one for the test and then the one that will be kitted out for all the, the astronaut hardware. Uh, also, there was uh, the news that the Lunar Trailblazer mission is under review by NASA. It's another one of these like low-cost simplex mission, right? That's the small innovative missions for planetary exploration. This also includes Escapade and uh, the Janus spacecraft, which both have had issues with their launch vehicles. Um, so Lunar Trailblazer is supposed to launch in 2023 and supposed to look at water deposits. And unfortunately, they're having to bring it in for review because it's going way over its $55 million budget. NASA internally has even said that they need to increase the budget for these small missions because they, they just can't fit them within you know, the cost that they have. Uh, NASA also announced that the first flight of Starliner is currently now set for early 2023. We had thought that it might get in before the end of 2022, but, you know, there's a lot of work going on to correct minor problems that were encountered during the uncrewed test flight back in May. Uh, so that will delay its launch until uh, later. You know, things like the orbital maneuvering and attitude control thrusters that shut down during the orbital insertion burn. They think this is debris related, but they can't tell because the thrusters were destroyed during re-entry. Um, they also had issues with reaction control thrusters that shut down. Those... <clears throat> Those they actually have a better idea about. They're just going to tweak timing tolerances, that kind of thing. Uh, issues with thermal control loop, they believe, again, is filters, which they now think are not necessary, so they will remove those. And uh, they found problems with guidance software, which will be worked on. But hopefully we will see the first crew of Starliner launching you know, next year, which you know is quite something when you consider that like Sunita Williams was assigned to Starliner back in 2018. She's been waiting all this time, long time for a great astronaut like her to be sitting with her feet on the ground. Okay, back to space and the space station. There was a Russian EVA to unlock or to prepare the European robotic arm, which is on the side of Nauka. It has been, this arm has been built like a decade ago and it spent many years in storage and they're having to prepare it. So Oleg Artemyev and Denis Mativ went out on an EVA and as they were working on it, um, they basically had a problem with Artemyev's spacesuit. He got a low voltage warning, and as soon as they got that, they were like, Oleg, <laughs> get back to the airlock right now. If you don't get back, you will lose communications. So they had to abort the spacewalk. O Oleg went back to the airlock, plugged himself in. Denis finished working on, you know, secured this, the arm, and then he returned. So they are planning a second walk, that will be in September 2nd, that will continue what they were doing and add in a few goals for the next step out. Um, so anyway, yeah, minor spacesuit emergency, that means that both US and Russia have had emergency problems with their spacesuits this year. Okay, NASA is also asking the US space industry for proposals to deorbit the International Space Station in around 2030. So I did a, I looked at this back uh, a year or so ago, what the plans were. And back then they had this blueprint which would require three Progress spacecraft to all dock to the Russian section and work together. Now, 2030, I'm not sure three Progress spacecraft will be available due to a relationship with Russia at this point. I mean, yes, Russia wants to get out of the ISS. I'm sure they would gladly sell NASA Progress spacecraft for a massive markup. Um, but yes, it looks like they're looking for US companies to do the same thing. The technical requirements, the vehicle has to deliver 47 meters per second of Delta V to a 450 ton space station. It has to be able to dock to the front of the space station and then stay on orbit for a whole year. Uh, I think actually dock, I think it has to go up and it will get berthed by the, by the arm, sorry. Uh, and it has to be able to launch within six months of it being required, 
but also be ready potentially well after 2030 if there is, are any more extensions to the International Space Station. So, yeah, so that require, those are the requirements. They're looking for input. Again, I'm going to point out that if you're building this, why not build something to push the space station to a higher orbit? Or at the very least, please send some space archaeologists because the International Space Station has a lot of interesting history attached to it that is probably unwritten and undocumented. Uh, NASA also gave uh, Orbital Reef the, the green light. They performed like a technical redesign review to make sure that the concept actually passes muster and delivers the requirements and needs of the L commercial LEO destinations program. So Orbital Reef is the collaboration between Blue Origin and Sierra Space and a bunch of other partners like Boeing and whatnot. So that design is going to move forward. Um, finally, yeah, Ukraine, they purchased an exclusive uh, exclusive special access to ISI's SAR satellite network. So ISI are, they run like 15 SAR synthetic aperture radar satellites. And there was a Ukrainian actor, you know, TV celebrity who was procuring donations to buy drones. Then when they bought the drones, the supplier basically gave them a massive discount leaving them with all this money on their hands. So they thought, apparently they then approached this Finnish company, ISI, to buy satellite time. And they went one better than just accessing satellites. They actually got the rights to a single satellite and the ability to task it to perform passes over when it's over Ukraine and the region so that they can get the data of their choice. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's fascinating. I'm not sure, like they say that they bought the whole satellite, which I'm not sure why that would make sense because most of the time the satellite isn't passing over the region where, uh, you know, they're operating. I imagine that it's only buying the satellite access when it's over the region of interest and elsewhere it's doing stuff for other customers. I'm not really sure. This is interesting as well because ISI is a Finnish company and Finland, of course, now is uh, all up about joining NATO after the invasion of Ukraine. So yeah, I think that's most of the stuff. We Hopefully we will get back after Artemis and we will have some glorious uh, views of the launch and whatnot. But until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.